All right, well, welcome to the um, uh, ETGC, the East Texas Geriatric Education Center uh, lecture series in basic geriatrics and gerontology. Uh, my name is Tony Denuzzo. Uh I am the program director for the ETGC. And uh, this is an ongoing lecture series that we've been doing since June of last year. And it's covering major topics in geriatrics and gerontology. Uh, today's topic is overview of health insurance for older populations. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge our um, a partnership with the East Texas AHEC group uh, and be uh, very helpful in getting this organized and set up. We have coordinators set up at different sites throughout East Texas and we are broadcasting to several sites that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, I'd like to just make a quick announcement. Uh, we have a, a, a really nice symposium set up uh, for a week from this next Monday on April 18th. Uh, it's the surgery in elderly patient Galveston 2. It's the second annual symposium on this topic. And uh, it's uh, Monday, at uh, April 18th. It uh, begins at 8.30 until 3 p.m. over Shriner Burns Hospital Auditorium. I do want to let you know that we will also be videotaping from there to this room on that day. So you don't have to go all the way to Shriners to see anything. Uh, it will be here. The reason for that is that um, we were expecting a really big turnout, and we were a little concerned that we would have enough room in there. Plus, Galveston College is sending their um, nursing program students to attend this as well, which is great. And it, we're, they're expecting anywhere between 20 and 40 students for that. And so we're going to send them here instead of over there. And uh, so that will take care. And they, they could also have little discussions little side discussions on their own about what's going on with the material. So uh, please look for these flyers. They're outside. You are welcome to, to go and, and uh, participate. And we are offering quite a bit of uh, um, CE credits for it. Six credits, Category 1 for CME, 0.5 credits of ethical uh, professional responsibility credits, as well as 6.7 contact hours for uh, uh, continuing nursing education. Lots of hours. Okay. I got to tell you, though, those uh, may not be free. <laughs> you may have to be sending in your $25 for your CME credit and things to, to, to get those. But anyway, take a look at the brochure, and it's really good information. I hope you can make it. All right, uh, getting back to what's going on today. Uh, and you, you have pack, uh, handouts. Hopefully, there's, there's enough. If, there, if you haven't gotten a handout and you need one, let me know. We'll get some outside. And uh, this is our agenda for today. Uh, we have three speakers. And it's going to follow basically a progression of looking at the history of uh, Medicare and, and health insurance for older adults. That will be presented by uh, Dr. Gene Freeman, with, followed by some discussion. We're going to have a short break. Uh, and uh, then we could, followed by uh, the, the nuts and bolts, basically, of the good and bad news of uh, medical care and insurance given by uh, Ms. Penny Davis. And uh, then followed also by some discussion. And if, then we're going to wrap it up. Uh, at around 2 o'clock or so uh, with a, pr a presentation by uh, Dr. Joanna Campbell looking at the barriers of health care for the elderly in terms of having Medicare and like, well, why isn't everything covered? <laughs> and what are the issues that go on with um, uh, obtaining uh, adequate health care? And then followed by some other discussions. There are plenty of evaluation forms to fill out. Uh, we would like to have an evaluation form uh, for this session. If you could take some time, they're outside on the tables as well. As I said, this is a continuing series of lectures. Uh, next month is uh, basically the, not so much the last lecture, it's the last one in the series that we planned. And uh, it's going to cover palliative care, end of life, advanced care planning. We have some really good speakers set up for that one as well. And that's going to be on Friday, May 13th. And all of these, if you want to, are on the second Friday of each month from 12 to 3 p.m. Uh, these are the learning objectives for today. Uh, the first two are uh, for, for Dr. Freeman's uh, presentation. The next two are for uh, Penny Davis's. And then the last two are for Joanna Campbell's. They, are in, all in your, they should be in your handout. I said that this is a, a lecture series uh, that we've been going on for, for now almost uh, well, for 11 months. And we're going to continue this even after May. We're going to have uh, topics in June and July. Right now we're looking at a topic in sensory impairment in, in June, uh, covering vision, hearing, as well as um, speech pathology. 
And then in, in July, we're going to look at health behaviors, including nutrition, exercise, and uh, actually even drive, driving issues for older adults. Uh, if there's enough interest, we're going to try and form something in August. And that's going to be um, on ethics in aging uh, and, and elder abuse. Okay. Uh, a lot of this information is on our website for the UTGC. Uh, take a look at that if you'd like. Uh, just so we have a better communication with the other sites as well, I have a BlackBerry. So they can go and talk to me <laughs> about, what, um, about the information or anything going on at the other sites. Move that over. Okay. Uh, there are many programs and activities uh, within the Scholar of Aging program, which this is a part of. And these are the activities that we set up uh, for the April uh, sessions, uh, including case studies and a journal article review for this, this month in terms of the things that are. And this is only for those that are signed up for the Scholar of Aging program, which is a 160-hour program in basic uh, geriatrics and gerontology. Not something that you have to do unless you really want to. Okay, and you can take a look at this. It's also the information is on our website. Uh, lots of resources regarding Medicare, and uh, we have those will also be on the website. Uh, we have video conferencing to uh, five different sites: Lamar University in Beaumont, uh, Stephen F. Austin State University in Nacogdoches, Sam Houston State in Huntsville, uh, University of Texas Health Center at Tyler and McLennan Community College in Waco. And if you want to, well, we kind of lost our signal on a couple of them. But they're back there on the monitor. Okay. Uh, finally, our last feature is that we have uh, CE credits that we're offering. Uh, these actually are free for this session. Uh, CME credits for um, physicians, uh, nurse practitioners, and uh, physician assistants, 2.7 hours uh, are for the entire three-hour session. And uh, if you have any questions about that, you can contact the Continuing Education Office. There are CME evaluation forms and requests out on the table. We offer uh, continuing nursing education credits for uh, registered nurses. LVNs have a separate um, certificate of attendance if they would like to get that. And we're offering 3.2 contact hours up to that amount. You don't have to stay for the entire three hours to get any CME credits. And, and that's explained also on the credit request form that's out on the tables if you'd like to apply for that. We offer uh, 0.3 hours of uh, CEUs for social workers. There's a separate sign-in sheet for the social workers as well as a separate evaluation form. And that, those are also located outside on the tables. And finally, uh, CEUs for physical therapists, occupational therapists, um, three CE contact hours, and explained in your, con in your packet on how to obtain those. Uh, I'd like to, uh, I'm required to say that uh, none, of our, none of our speakers today, Dr. Freeman, uh, Ms. Penny Davis, and Dr. Joanna Campbell have any uh, commercial affiliations to disclose. All right, any questions on CE or anything that I've talked about so far? All right, great, let's get into the program. Our first speaker, uh, who many of you know, uh, has been here several years. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Jean Freeman. Uh, she's professor in, professor in the Department of in, uh, Internal Medicine, Division of Geriatrics, and she is also, also adjunct faculty for preventive medicine and community health. Uh, she's the Grace uh, Berkish uh, Nensinger Distinguished uh, Fellowship uh, Professorship Award in Aging. Uh, recently received that. Congratulations. Um, there's a bio that's also in your handout. Uh, I'll describe it briefly that uh, Dr. Freeman received a PhD in 1984 in epidemiology and public health from Yale University. And she began at UTMB as associate professor in the Department of Internal Medicine in 92. And uh, as I said, received a Distinguished Professor Award. Uh, she's been a a very active in mammography use research, particularly examining barriers to mammography use among older Hispanic women. And she's awarded many grants uh, to conduct this research, as well as directing the Health Services Research Program at UTMB. Uh, she has numerous publications that focus on access to health care and how to minimize health disparities among all the populations. And uh, I welcome you. I'm really glad you're all here. This should be a really interesting and informative uh, session today. And I turn it over to Dr. Freeman. Okay. Um, thank you. 
this year marks the 40th anniversary of the enactment uh, of Medicare, and I uh, thought it was a good time to reflect on its origins, how it came about. This year marks the 40th anniversary uh, of Medicare, and uh, that was a good time to reflect on its origins. How did it come about and its impact, not only for uh, the older population, but also for the uh, United States population as a whole. Uh, for the past 40 years, Medicare has provided essentially uh, universal health care insurance for persons over 65. And its impact on health care use for that population was seen uh, virtually immediately from the time it was implemented in 1966. Uh, I have three main learning objectives. Uh, by the end of this lecture, my aim is for each of you to be able to first describe the political and social forces promoting national health insurance for the aged, uh, two, to understand the legislative history of Medicare, and then three, uh, for you to be able to discuss Medicare's impact on the organization financing and delivery of health care. The origins of Medicare can probably be really traced to the uh, turn of the century uh, when labor health insurance reformers were attempting to get some kind of uh, medical health care insurance bill through some of the state legislatures, but were unsuccessful primarily due to the opposition, opposition of some very powerful groups at the time, uh, in particular the American Medical Association. But most of the action that actually led to uh, the Medicare program's adoption in 1965 occurred in the administrations of three uh, very powerful presidents, Roosevelt, Truman, and Johnson. President Roosevelt was uh, the president during the uh, time of the Great Depression, the Depression years being in the 1930s, uh, when there was considerable concern about the economic security of the population. And in 1934, he appointed an advisory committee on economic security and he charged the committee to provide advice not only on how to protect uh, the general population for uh, uh, losses in income, but he also charged them to provide advice to him on the subject of establishing a government national health insurance program. The mere mention of national health insurance at the time, thinking about some kind of government-sponsored health insurance program, created a lot of uh, controversy and opposition, again, primarily by the American Medical Association, who felt that this would open the door to socialized medicine. In the end of, uh, by the end of Roosevelt's uh, term in office, actually uh, in 1935, he was successful in establishing the Social Security Act, and it did offer some income protection, as you know, for some uh, parts of the population. Uh, it provided protection in the form of old age insurance, Social Security for the older population. It also passed on unemployment insurance and some uh, forms of public assistance and welfare but it did not include uh, any provision for expanding health care coverage, which is what Roosevelt really wanted it to do, uh, even for the more vulnerable populations. Uh, strong opposition to national health insurance continued, and Roosevelt uh, was not able to uh, uh, come up with anything uh, legislatively uh, during the time of his administration. He actually left office in 1945 when he, uh, when he died. Uh, the Truman administration, though, which immediately followed uh, Roosevelt's uh, continued attempts to adopt some form of compulsory health insurance program at the national level. Um, the issue at Truman's time, which was a boom time for the United States post-war, was no more uh, a concern about economic security and providing health insurance for that, but it was more concerned about the inequities that we were seeing and the distribution of health care across different groups uh, of, of the population. Uh, there were a number of bills proposed during his time. He, again, was another passionate uh, a person in terms of wanting to have some kind of legislation that would provide equal access to care for the, for the population. He tried uh, numerous attempts uh, to pass bills uh, providing national health insurance, but they all failed to pass. Uh, too few of the legislators in either the House or the Senate really supported the program, and again, the American Medical Association was continuing to vigorously oppose it. Um, he did persist, as I said, throughout his term as president and, and ultimately conceded at the end of his administration that a national health insurance program probably wasn't feasible at this time. And he conceded to a more narrower form of insurance, focused on the elderly, covering only hospital care. Uh, and this uh, sort of concession, this kind of incrementalism as he, as he saw it, uh, marked the emergence of Medicare. The term Medicare came into being and, and became to be known as health insurance for the elderly and it's the issue that was pursued in future administrations. Um, at the time, it was felt that the elderly were uh, an acceptable, good group to target as needy. Uh, clearly, they had lower earnings and higher medical cost. 
Uh, moreover, many of the older adults at the time were being cared by their uh, children who would probably therefore support some kind of health insurance for their parents. So it was felt that this was a good group to target for, uh, for a number of reasons. Um, a couple of presidents followed Truman. Uh, Eisenhower followed him uh, right away. He was opposed to any kind of social insurance policy, so nothing happened there. Then Kennedy, who followed Eisenhower, uh, did call for universal health insurance for the elderly, but was assassinated early in his term. Uh, then finally, President Johnson uh, won a landslide victory in 1964, and this is when things started to really uh, click. Um, also, the election that uh, voted him into office cleared out most of the opposition to Medicare that there was in the uh, House and the Senate. Uh, Johnson, uh, a third president who, uh, again, had this as a major priority for his Great Society agenda, uh, gave it a high priority among his Great Society programs, and it was enacted as part of the Social Security Amendments of 1965. Uh, following that, there were a series of amendments to the Social Security Act, which gradually uh, formed uh, Medicare. Um, the legislation that he passed, uh, the Social Security Amendments of 1965, provided health insurance for the aged, and it was mainly to cover primarily hospital and physician services. This is when they established the two parts of the program. Uh, part A, through amend these amendments, provided coverage for hospital insurance benefits, and it was financed primarily through the Social Security earnings tax. Um, part B was also established through these amendments, and it covered physician services, lab tests, supplies and equipment some home health services, and it was financed largely through premiums and the general income. Uh, since its initial enactment in 1965 and then its implementation in 1966, uh, the Medicare program has gradually evolved through a series of amendments uh, and legislative changes from year to year to either add cover services, uh, extending Medicare coverage to other populations, or change the methods of reimbursing hospitals and physicians. These were all done legislatively. And I'm going to highlight the major changes up through 2003, just to give you an appreciation of how the program actually has evolved incrementally over the past two, uh, 40 years. Uh, the first set of changes came in 1967 uh, with amendments to the Social Security Act. Uh, these amended amendments expanded coverage for durable medical equipment in the home, it added podiatrist services, and it added outpatient physical therapy. Uh, in the 1970s and the 1980s, uh, the Social Security amendments that were made were largely aimed at trying to institute changes in the program that would uh, in some way control the spiraling costs of care that were occurring due to the uh, increased access after the implementation of the program. Uh, in particular, the 1972 Social Security amendments established the professional standard review organizations. These were uh, organizations that were responsible for monitoring not only the quality of care given to Medicare beneficiaries, but also their utilization of health services. Uh, it was felt that this uh, monitoring through utilization review activities, and basically very limited utilization review, just looking at how long people stayed in the hospital, it was felt that they could, uh, if they could succeed in reducing the length of stay, they might be able to reduce expenditures uh, this way. Uh, these amendments also, at the time, uh, limited payments for capital expenditures by hospitals, funded demonstration projects to increase the efficiency of hospitals. Demonstration projects uh, at this time were really aimed towards starting to look at different ways of reimbursing uh, hospitals for providing care. In addition, they added uh, two more groups uh, to be covered by Medicare, those with end-stage renal disease and those with um, disabilities. Um, in 1983, uh, again, the, the amendments were directed in the program that would increase uh, uh, efficiency and therefore decrease cost of care. Uh, in particular, these amendments uh, initiated the prospective payment system, which we have today, uh, the DRGs. Uh, this is where the hospitals are now being paid a fixed price per case, regardless of how much it costs the hospital to provide services. And this, too, was another effort to try to rein in the spiraling cost of care we were seeing over the 70s and 80s. Um, these amendments were also looking toward changing the way physicians were being paid. And in these amendments, Congress directed the Reagan administration to initiate some kind of study about physician payment reform. In uh, 1985, the Cons Consolidated Omnibus Reconciliation Act added the disproportionate share adjustments to the prospective payment system. This is where the hospitals got a, um, an additional adjustment if they saw a disproportionate share of uh, poor patients. The act also added the hospice care as a permanent part of the Medicare program. 
Uh, it limited increases in prospective payment rates, and it formally established the Physician Payment Review Commission to examine alternative ways of paying physicians for, for their services under Medicare. In uh, 1989, the uh, Omnibus Reconciliation Act uh, officially uh, directed the actual imp implementation of a new way of, of uh, paying for physicians through the resource-based relative value scale in 1992. Um, this method tended to be more uh, equitable across specialties. Um, broadly speaking, the scale was an index that was developed by a, a, an academic group that reflected the relative amount of work uh, for a particular service or procedure. Um, it was felt that this kind of um, way of reimbursing f physicians would make it more equi equitable uh, across different specialties. Prior to this, the specialties who tended to do a lot of procedures got more money compared to those uh, who didn't. And this was an, an attempt to try to um, equalize those uh, uh, rates across the different uh, groups of physicians. Uh, the Balanced Budget Act of 1997 was perhaps the most significant piece of legislation, oddly enough, uh, in terms of its impact on the system because it dramatically affected how much money was going to be um, allocated to uh, Medicare. Uh, it required a five-year reduction of $115 billion uh, in expenditure growth. It added Medicare plus choice. This is Part C. And it also established a cap on the number of medical residents supported by the, the uh, Medicare Graduate Education Program. And then finally, uh, the Medicare Prescription Drug Improvement Modernization Act of 2003 um, offers a voluntary drug benefit under a new Part D of Medicare. Um, although all beneficiaries entitled to Part A or enrolled to Part B are eligible, the legislation really was aimed at trying to help low-income beneficiaries. And I think Ms. Davis will talk to you some more about this one in particular, since it's, it is the most recent uh, change. Uh, there's no question really that, um, that the implementation of Medicare uh, in 1966 and uh, subsequent modifications really dramatically changed the landscape of the healthcare, U uh, U.S. healthcare system, how healthcare was delivered, um, uh, not only for the three groups that it covered, the elderly, those with disabilities, uh, those with end-stage renal disease, but it, it changed the, the structure of the whole healthcare system for everyone. And I'd like to give you a, a brief overview of this impact. Uh, first, within the, within the um, first few years of, of implementation, we saw several indications of its expanded access to care uh, through increased health insurance coverage for older adults, increased hospitalization rates, and longer lengths of stay. At the time, there really was very little data available on the uh, use of healthcare services in the United States, but we did get some from the uh, National Health Interview Survey. Uh, this is a bar graph that gives you the uh, percent of persons with hospital insurance by age for the period 62 to 63. These are the first few years before, um, what's right, okay. before the implementation of Medicare. And as you can see, only about 54% of the elderly had any kind of form of health insurance compared to much higher rates in the other age groups ranging between roughly 65 to 75 percent for those less than 15 through 64. Um, the other thing we saw <coughs> was that there were um, more specifically uh, very limited numbers of, per very limited percent of persons 65 and over who were covered for any kind of uh, surgical insurance. It's about 45 percent for over 65, uh, around 65, 70 percent for the other groups. This is, again, all before Medicare. Um, not having health insurance at all put on a great economic burden on, on the patients because they had to pay a large uh, part of the bill. Uh, and this is a bar graph that gives you an idea of the actual percent of hospital discharges for which no part of the hospital bill was paid by insurance. Again, comparing the age groups in the period before the implementation of Medicare. And for the elderly, it was up close to 50% um, of hospital discharges among the elderly uh, were not paid, uh, did not have the entire bill paid for, for them through health insurance, and the beneficiary had to pay, uh, the person had to pay for it out of pocket. And these rates were much lower, as you can see, for the um, younger ages. This, these numbers changed considerably just a few years later with the implementation of Medicare. And I'm going to show you a series of charts now that compare. <coughs> Uh, the two age groups before and after uh, Medicare. 
This chart presents the percent of persons with, hospitalization, with hospital insurance. Um, as we saw before, looking again at the elderly, only about 54% of them had health insurance. And now it's up around 95% through Medicare. Very little, some differences in the other age groups, but nothing like we saw for the, um, for the elder, elderly population. And likewise for um, surgical insurance. That was just hospital insurance, same thing we see for surgical insurance. Much uh, greater increases, virtually doubled for the uh, older population, much smaller changes for the younger population. Um, another thing people looked at after the implementation of Medicare was just their, their use of health services as a rough measure of access. It's, it's really about all we had at the time to see um, the extent to which the older patients were, were accessing health services. So this shows you the rates of discharges from short-stay hospitals per thousand persons from the period July 63 through July 65 versus 68 through 69. And these numbers were chosen because, these dates were chosen because that's the only data I was able to find for a comparison before and after. And you can see a, a fairly dramatic increase in the rates of hospitalization for the elderly pe old population from about 180 per, th per thousand to up to about 240 per thousand. Very little changes in the other groups. In fact, a slight decline. Do you know why they declined? Any idea why we would see a decline in the other groups or is an increase in the larger ones? One thing that happened is that the hospitals now suddenly had, had to, to um, increase their capacity to handle all these patients. So it resulted in a great increase for the uh, older population and possibly, well, this is just speculation, a decrease in the younger population because they just didn't have the beds to handle all the admissions for them. Uh, like the stay was another measure of uh, use Again, large increases for the elderly from about 12.4 um, to about 14 and a half. Uh, very little differences in length of stay for the younger population. Uh, one other big thing that we saw over this period was um, obviously an increase in per capita health care expenditures. Um, this is a curve that shows you from 1950 to about 1966 before the implementation of Medicare, there was an increasing trend. Um, these, are the, these are per capita health care expenditures, so it's not due to the growth of the population. But it turned from a linear trend to almost an exponential trend after 66. Uh, over this period, uh, per capita rates were increasing at the rate of about, oh, I don't know, what is that, about 10, 10 per, uh, per year, and then it's, it goes up, uh, doubles that as the, as the years progress after, after 1965. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't uh, are those adjusted for inflation? I believe they are, yeah, for inflation. Those rates are usually done that way. <coughs> um, over the long run, reflecting on the changes over the past 40 years, not the immediate uh, changes as we saw in some of these graphs, we see that Medicare has been responsible actually for many uh, innovations in, in health care reimbursement. Um, in particular, the DRG prospective payment system, which brought about a kind of capitated system for, uh, for hospitals, uh, was, a, was a major innovation. And although it started with Medicare in the United States, uh, nationally it then trickled down to the states in the United States and ultimately was adopted by other countries, not only for hospital reimbursement purposes, but also as a way of allocating resources through global budgeting and other forms of resource allocation. Um, likewise, Medicare was a pioneer in terms of developing new ways of thinking about reimbursing physicians. Uh, it was the one responsible, it was the group, the program responsible for developing the resource-based relative value scale for physician reimbursement, which is also being used uh, in other contexts other than Medicare. Um, the other uh, area where it had a lot of impact was in terms of introducing systems to improve the, uh, the quality of care. Uh, first, through the professional standards review organizations, which were implemented in 1972, they were the ones who first systematically looked at data to just check on basic things like uh, mortality rates within hospitals. Very simple uh, profiles they would develop for the hospitals and make them available for the peer review organizations to look at and possibly introduce some change within their uh, organizations. Um, later on, there were uh, developments through the Medicare uh, Healthcare Improvement Program. Um, this was a program that was uh, developed, I think, back in the early 90s uh, to uh, em empower uh, individual states, medical care, I think what they're called, um, quality improvement organizations to look at uh, the quality of care in individual states. These kinds of uh, 
programs and organizations developed healthcare quality indicators and also were responsible for um, making them public. Um, I should, uh, should also note that Medicare was one of the first pioneers to make public information on hospital quality care available. In 19, 1987, they did something quite radical. They published the um, mortality rates for certain kinds of hospitalization uh, in, 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 uh, in a, a pu publicly available report, which was picked up by the New York Times and other organizations. And there you saw it on the front page of your local newspaper where your hospital stood in the United States relative to other hospitals in terms of their um, in terms of their mortality rates. It was quite uh, striking. And uh, soon after that, other types of organizations followed in terms of publishing their healthcare information as well. I think well, probably well, one of the most profound impacts uh, that Medicare has had um, in the United States has been in the area of health disparities. Prior to Medicare's implementation, hospital discrimination was widespread throughout the country. And it wasn't just in the southern states. It was in the northern states as well. Uh, discrimination was expressed in a variety of ways in terms of uh, denial of staff privileges to minority physicians. Uh, refusal to, to admit minority applicants to residency training programs, uh, failure to provide medical care to uh, minority populations, and also uh, having hospitals maintaining separate, segregated patient wards. When Medicare was enacted, uh, hospitals had to comply with Title VI of the 1964 Civil Rights Act in order to participate in the program and receive reimbursement for providing hospital services for the aged. Uh, this act uh, prohibited the provision of any federal funds to organizations that engaged in racial segregation or other forms of discrimination. In fact, the first real test of the Civil Rights Act in 1964 was with the implementation of Medicare in 1966. Uh, Medicare uh, instituted a hospital certification program in which hospitals had to demonstrate that they met the Title VI hospital review guidelines. In other words, they couldn't say they're going to be working on it. <laughs> that they're getting there, they had to show that they were already there, that they had already desegregated and according to the guidelines that the uh, Medicare program set out. Um, there were clearly strong incentives for the hospital to comply. They couldn't just said, well, we'll just ignore you and walk away for it since there was this large amount of money that they could access to, uh, to take care of the patients. Um, Title VI was uh, successful in, in desegregating the vast majority of the hospitals. Um, Medicare also appeared to uh, narrow the uh, gap that we've been seeing in terms of access to care for the different racial groups. Again, data is kind of limited on this uh, from the uh, early 60s and, and 50s. But from what data we have, we begin to see uh, differences in length of stay and hospital discharges, just like we saw over time. But we began to see a narrowing in the differences across different racial groups. Uh, and probably, I think, uh, just to wrap it up, in, in terms of the future, I, I think this is, this is a, an area where Medicare can have a, a considerable impact just because of its sheer power. It's, it leads, it's the major regulator and the major provision of services um, in the United States. It, it has uh, enormous capability to uh, make requirements of the hospitals in terms of uh, reducing and eliminating uh, these, these disparities uh, of care. Um, they could, for example, um, reward, and I think they already do reward hospitals and, and healthcare systems for reducing their disparities. They could also restrict reimbursement for uh, institutions that um, are continuing to, to show these, these large disparities in healthcare. Uh, finally, they have a, a wonderful source of data, which those of us in research use all the time. The database is the claims for all the um, services provided to older patients. They can use these data to actually track disparities in health care, to um, provide incentives for people to think about ways to reduce them through demonstration products, as they did earlier. And um, thereby, anything that happens within Medicare soon spreads to the rest of the population. So they could have enormous influence and impact in that area as well. So um, lastly, there are a number of really good references, if you'd like to pursue this further, that um, I used in putting together just the key points for this lecture. Um, particular books by Marilyn Moon and, uh, and Ted Marmer on the, on the kind of the politics of Medicare and, and how it evolved are, are really quite striking and, and good to read, interesting to read. Uh, that ends my, my um, presentation. Okay.
Do I ask your questions? There's, there's time and room uh, for some questions and comments. Uh, anybody have? We, got, we have a good five, ten minutes for this. Good luck. Uh, I could start, I guess. I had, um, with the, uh, the graph on um, uh, showing exponential increase mm -hmm. in uh, per capita uh, to health care. Yeah. It's hard, uh, so that basically can be explained or attributed as it translates to improved access to um, health care or you know, based on having that. Uh, yeah, that, that's a good. That's a good point. It, it's two things. It's, it's growth and in, in, in access. People using health services more. Mm -hmm. And it's also probably a reflection of things just becoming more expensive to produce. In other words, less efficient care going on. So it's, a, it's a combination of the two. But the positive side is, yes, it, it could reflect greater access to care, as it did with the Medicare population and others. But it, it, there was also some concern that it was also a reflection of just poor wasted services. And, that was one of the reasons why Medicare wanted to take the lead in trying to look at that aspect of it. I mean, they were fine with providing more services, but um, they also wanted the services to be provided more efficiently through better hospital reimbursement systems, uh, better utilization review mechanisms, and possibly even better ways of reimbursing the, the physicians. I'll come up with another question. We have our other groups, there they kind of are. And um, just so you know, this, uh, this right here is Stephen F. Austin University, Ms. Lamar, um, Clinton Community College, and behind there, working on the net net uh, system, is uh, Tyler and also Sandy State. So and this little box here is uh, three sites, and there's Danforth. Uh, if you're wondering where everybody is. <laughs> and so we also like to get some interaction and some other opportunities for some of the other sites to ask any questions. Uh, now's a, a good time if uh, you want to, now I can tell you to uh, turn the mutes off <laughs> and uh, have, have some discussion and join in. Anybody over this okay? Three, Three? I mean, how much of an impact would Medicare um, uh, impact in the U.S. the, the longevity and the extension of life? That's a good point. That's been brought up for discussion in, in a number of, of, of articles. The longevity has been significant for it. It's hard to pin down how much impact Medicare could have had, how much medical care could have had on the, on the thing. But generally, we do look at that too as a measure of how um, our population has. Uh, been successful in increasing years of life, but but it is hard. It's very hard to tie it to the Medicare to tie it to healthcare in general. You know, when I was looking at your graphs of that in increase in the in the care of the elderly after the 60s, you know, it seemed to correlate with the decrease in mortality starting in the 1960s yeah. for cardiovascular strokes. Yes. So if 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 Medicare did impact in that manner for our elderly. How, how, what is that saying about our elderly now that have Medicare and have so this hospital services compared to say somebody in Italy where their aged population, which I don't think they have anything like a Medicare, would their aged population be maybe healthier than? I think you know, Elena's not here, unfortunately, Dr. Wolfie. I, I, uh, I think they have some form of national health insurance. So, they, okay. so that most European <laughs> countries. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it kind of brings up a point about where are we headed with respect to uh, national health insurance. And it's, it's one of the things that, was, that struck me as I reviewed the, the, uh, the origins and the legislative history and everything. In the United States, it's just come about through a series of very incremental changes. You know, first we start thinking about maybe um, health care through the state legislatures, then we go nationally. We think about providing access to care for everybody. Well, let's just focus on, on, the, on the elderly. So we added them on. Then we added on other groups. And then we kept extending the coverage. And perhaps this is a, there's a trend here that at some point in the future, we'll actually come to a point where Medicare just gets extended to everybody in the population. Because that's what's, ha what's happening. Medicare is here. It just keeps getting expanded with more and more people and ultimately encompasses the whole United States. And it takes, uh, also takes looking at, looking at the history of it, uh, some very strong presidents who are just 
impassioned with this, with this uh, notion of providing equal access to care through a universal health insurance system. We are continuing to lag behind the other countries in terms of many measures of health and health status, and, and a large part of that may be, may be our health insurance system, lack of, or lack of health insurance system. As well as uh, satisfaction with the health care system. Yes. 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 Any other comments, questions? Thank you very much.